it's Andrew Eborn here with another edition of the Andrew Eborn Show. And I'm delighted, absolutely delighted, to see my good chum, Dawn. How are you, Dawn? I'm very well, thank you. It's great to see you. In fact, the last time I saw you was right at the beginning of the year, all the way back in January, uh, when you were performing brilliantly at the O2 in Islington. Yes, that was actually the last gig we played before uh, Corona erupted. So I have kind of bittersweet memories, really. <laughs> I know, and it, it's been really tragic because it was such a great gig and you were there uh, together with my other great chum, Toya, and it was a fantastic night. 25th of January, can you believe we're now That's already right. I know. in yeah. September? So yeah. we, had, we had loads of gigs in the diary because it's our 10th anniversary. We had so many gigs and our album launch, um, one in London, one in Berlin, and it's just all been wiped out. So Talk, talk about maximum damage. You, you couldn't have yes. made the album more appropriately, could you? What a nightmare. Well, that's what I thought, actually. <laughs> So when, when, when you did that, though, I mean, I, I know, like, I've been speaking to lots of performers on the show, and they all had lots of gigs lined up. 2020 was going to be a great year for live music, yeah. especially for you with your 10th year. How many gigs did you lose, and how did you cope? Um, well, I'm still not coping, really. <laughs> um, we had the, we had the uh, finishing the album off to kind of occupy us. Um, Oh, I mean, I can't, I've, I've kind of lost count of the number of gigs. We, we had quite a few in the diary and we were about to start booking a, an Asian tour as well. Yeah, I saw that because you're popular in zillions of different countries, not just fantastic in, in, in this country as well. But you did, a, you did one of these online concerts as well. We've done lots of those. We did, we did lots of isolation gigs. We've done loads and loads of live videos, plus lots of videos, lots of studio videos for the for the album. So we've been kind of crazily busy, I think, just to distract us from the fact that we can't play live. Because yeah, it's I, so I, painful. It, it is, I mean, and you miss, I know a lot of people are doing these online gigs, but they miss that interaction where, I mean, you are oh, such gosh, a yeah. fantastic performer where you get the whole crowd up and going. And if you don't have that, how does that feel? It's, it's like, well, the thing is, it, even in, in, normal t during normal times i find it really difficult to go more than a few weeks without a gig because it is like a drug for me and it is it's kind of what makes me happy and what makes me want to carry on living to be honest and so when that's not there anymore i find it really hard to to, to find kind of i think it's the adrenaline you know it's it's, it's, it's like a drug really it's like a drug and it just gives you that high. And so now I'm kind of, you know, jumping around in the, in the flat doing silly dance videos to try and get my ad adrenaline going just so that I can feel alive, you know? Well, silly dance videos are good. You have to post them. Yeah, they're quite fun, actually. I've never <laughs> done them before, before COVID. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what I love about you as well, though, Dawn, is you take us from a, a roller coaster of emotion because you have some iconic, really high energy songs, but also Out of Time, which with that brilliant black and white video off the new album, is just sensational. Tell oh, me about you. that song and how that came about. Is that again a prophecy of what we're the current times? Um, that was, that was, I mean, I wrote that before COVID and uh, having sort of moved pretty much. I sort of live between London and Berlin, but I kind of feel like I've left behind my life there. And um, when I find, it's, it's, you know, as I say in, in, in the song, when I find myself walking back those, the roads I used to live in and having all these memories around me, and yet I'm, you know, I'm pretty alone. I don't, I don't, I don't really meet up with that many people. And I, I used to know so many people through gigging and through teaching yoga as well. So there's always a chance that I'll bump into someone I know, but I feel like, um, I feel like a stranger there in many ways. I, I still have some good friends there, but I just feel that it is literally, you know, out of sight, out of mind. And, um, you know, these friends, if they're, if they're coming over to Berlin, they'll contact me and say, oh, you know, <laughs> let's meet up. Where can we go? Tell us where to go. Um, but I think people just, if you're not there, if you're not sort of on call, 
then you're very easily kind of lost in the ether, you know? Yeah, and, and you are right. I mean, it's not just in terms of a live audience, but as you say, you bounce off all, all sorts of people. And I mean, you were once described as the deranged child of Debbie, Harry, and Freddie Mercury, which I thought love was a child. Good... I think that was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the great <laughs> love child, even better. So yes, yeah. absolutely. And, and I, I love. I, how did you feel about that as a description? I thought it was great. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it just sums you up brilliantly because you have seeing your performances and such iconic bursting with energy on the stage. I mean, you absolutely own not just the stage but the whole venue when you go there, don't you? Oh, thank you. It, it, I actually find it quite difficult playing playing at bigger venues where you have the barriers up and you can't get down. You know, and I and I specifically asked if we could have some stairs put in for that gig so that I could because I like to go into the audience. And they, they wouldn't let me for, for security reasons. But it's a shame that when you saw us, it wasn't on an occasion where I could actually go into the audience because then I, then I really let rip and go crazy. Um, there won't be any of that going on for some time. Well, I, I was going to say, Paul, everyone you, has the vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, talk about social distancing. You can't yeah. do a das Fluff gig on, on that sort of basis. It wouldn't be the same sort of thing. But you, you've worked with some, I mean, a fantastic list of artists that you are. Talk me through some of those. In addition to the Toya gig that I saw you there, you've worked with oh. some other ma massively iconic artists. We've played with uh, Lydia Lunch and Lena Lovitch, who was, uh, that was a big thrill for me because I really idolized her when I was sort of a teenager. She was a big influence on me actually. And we've played with her a few times. Um, so many people, Clan of Zymox, um, B movie. I'm trying to remember the, some of the bigger names. There have been so many. It's you know, it's been ten years. Um, you've caught me off guard now. Well, that's all right. It's not, it's, all right. it's not a quiz. <laughs> You're not going for the car now. It's okay. I'm sorry. We, we walk away with a blankety <laughs> pen is what you get, Dawn. I'm afraid. But you were well. B movie. Yeah, in the forest, in the snow. They were on Remembrance Day. They played with Toya on that night as well. So uh, mm -hmm. and they're they're a, they're a great band. But Lena Lovage. I mean, if you, I was going to pair anybody for a perfect night, the characteristics of that sort of fusion of music is just superb, isn't it? Oh, have you frozen? It was re it was really exciting for me, and she's she's such an amazing performer. You know, she's in and so much um, presence and so much charisma, um, and she's also very, you know very shy. So I, I kind of relate to her in that I'm also very shy, although it doesn't come across on stage. But this this kind of dichotomy between um, being able to I think I think as well it's because because she almost cloaks herself in her in in her costumes as well and and that's and the way I wear so much makeup when I'm on stage and in real life it's um it's like it is like a mask and it gives you this um this character and suddenly you're you're somebody else and you feel you can do anything you know and it was, and that's what I was going to sort of touch on because when you, you look at Lena's work and you look at your work and everything else, you you are very similar characters. You say not just the shyness, but you talk about anxiety and anxiety dreams and so on and so forth. And and you, you clearly, as you say, you suffer from shyness, but you put on uh, that massive openness, if you like. And there's a lot of people in the entertainment business who are like that, who will be yes, the I'm big sorry. show people when they're yeah. on stage, but privately they're very very private, aren't they? Yeah, I, th I think that's quite common. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And, and how, do, how do you cope with that? I mean, you obviously, as you say, you, you talk about it publicly in, in your work anyway. How do you cope with the anxiety? The anxiety of, of living. Yeah, the anxiety. <laughs> well, living I, I is think, difficult. I think, <laughs> I think that the songwriting is a, is a big help. I, I don't want to call it therapy because I, I try and make it as kind of universal and as entertaining and accessible as, as possible. You know, I don't want to just kind of doom everybody out with, with my miserable nihilistic outlook on life. So uh, there's a lot, I think there's a lot of humor in, in a lot of my songs as well as the kind of angsty kind of <laughs> tragedy <laughs> of, of the world that we live in. Um, but, but people relate to it and, and that's the point it's okay not to be okay it's okay to talk about angst and it's okay to laugh at it but it's also yeah. a coping mechanism isn't it yes i think it is yeah 
Yeah. And, and I think that the reason that you talk about accessibility, the reason you throw yourself into the crowd is because you are vocalizing, you're, you're basically personifying people's angst in certain situations. And you will take them on the roller coaster. You will take them on that sort of high energy thing all the way down to what are quite melancholic uh, sort of songs as well. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think, um, I think the, way, the way our music is, is so eclectic, and as, as you said at the beginning, you know, it goes from this sort of high energy stuff to this very um, minimal, melancholic stuff. And, and I think, uh, you know, emotionally I'm quite extreme, I guess, and that comes out in my, in my songs. And so there's probably something for everyone. <laughs> oh, no, no, definitely. Among our catalog. And, and this is why we, we talk about, as you know, I work very closely with, with a number of major acts as well. So they always say about the Bee Gees, they, they do songs, the your, your soundtrack of your life. And when, when you listen to a lot of your music, it, it is that. There, there are different moods that you can go on. You can pluck things from different albums uh, and 10 of them now, which is phenomenal. And, and you can sit down and say, actually, this is perfectly epitomizes uh, the, the mood that I feel in. That's good. And there's, there's a real art to that. So tell me, when, when, how did you first start? What was your, um, as a child, when, when was your first sort of experience of music? What, what do you first remember hearing? Um, I, rem I remember the first time I sang on stage was when I was in uh, infant school, I think. When I used, to, um, I used to direct silly little shows at school. But I wasn't, you know, I, I, I didn't consider myself a very good singer by any stretch of the imagination and I you know I tried to play the guitar I tried to play the piano but I I wasn't you know gifted I wasn't a natural um, and then I started I started right I wrote a couple of songs and then I just ended up with a, a boyfriend who was a musician and we started up this electronic duo and so that's when I kind of I actually started performing and, and, I, and I was terrible because I was so shy and terrified. Um, but then I, I gradually sort of built up confidence. Um, and then I just, I just stopped. I, I, I moved on to theatre. I studied theatre. I was a theatre director and I was a yoga teacher. Um, and I just left music completely. And then when I came back to it, I was a different person. I was much more confident. Um, and it very quickly took over my life and became a, this huge, it's not even a passion, it's, it's an obsession, really. Well, well it, is, it is your life, so, as you say, you, you weave your right life around that. So what, what do you think gave you that confidence? I mean, you were doing yoga at the time. Is that, did that help you find the real dawn? I think, I think, the, I rem I think the moment I actually became confident as a performer was um, a, a friend of mine who's a musician. She recommended a, a singing teacher. And I just, I just went for a singing lesson. I'd never had one before. And, um, and, the, and the teacher told me how good my voice was. And I was completely shocked. And she, I think at the end of the class, she said to me, you, you were born to sing. And I was like, what? Because I, I couldn't really remember anyone other than maybe, you know, maybe friends saying, or, you know, and even, I don't even remember the friends saying that I could sing, to be honest. I thought I, you know, my songs were okay and I could get away with singing them. But when the singing teacher was so um, complimentary, I thought, oh, <laughs> Oh, okay. And then, and literally, I think things really changed for me that day. And, and that singing lesson where I, I, I sang more loudly and sang more notes than I ever had done before. And that was like, I don't know, it, that must, must be like being, being on ecstasy or something. I mean, it was, it was a really incredible experience. I lit, I literally, felt like I was on another planet when I came out. And I think that was a, a really big um, turning point for me, actually. And, and as you say, it's almost permission to be you, isn't it? Because I think when yeah. somebody says you're good at it, you can then get rid of those self doubts because you've got a bit, a bit of support. And you can actually Yeah, and it, it had genuinely not occurred to me before that I, that my voice was anything, you know, 
And who, who was the teacher? Do you remember their name? I can't remember. No, her name was Claire, I think. Claire. Oh, Claire, there you go. Her name's Claire. <laughs> Wonderful. Good old Claire. Claire will be watching now thinking, yeah, I love her. Oh, we love Claire. <laughs> I can't remember her name, but I love her. <laughs> That's great. I was going to say, you'll be getting her zillions of bookings if you have. You should be on commission. It'd be fantastic. <laughs> the one, Claire, who can give you confidence. And where, where is Claire based? Uh, this, was in, this was in London. It, there was an interesting story with her, actually, because she, she had her own bands. She was very young and beautiful and, and had her own band. And she was, she was making an album. And um, she, used to, she used to perform with a ukulele. Oh, I and love ukulele. She, um, she did a <laughs> she did a, a, a YouTube video and it went viral. Right. So she you know she looked at it one day and she had literally tens of thousands of views, and and so then she was getting all these you know record deals and everything and she she had an existing record record deal that she couldn't get out of, and she actually kind of went into hiding right. in France or something to record a new album for this other label but had to pretend she was someone else oh fantastic well that's that's what she wants so she probably i don't think she became, I don't think she became famous because i never actually saw her ah uh, well sorry there's there could oh, be yeah. a new george formby out there so so this is what she's going to have she, she'll be playing the ukulele it'd be, it'd be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so leaning on that lamppost at the corner of the street <laughs> that's claire teaching you on, on the side i love it that's a great great concept but but talking about record deals yeah. and and writing and that sort of stuff you have been prolific in your career i mean to come up with 10 albums worth of material it's not 10 albums it's it's actually five albums but 10 years well 10 so years oh, okay yeah, okay Five, five albums. Five, five is a lot less than ten. <laughs> well, it's five, but it's ten. It, ten is a good figure. To survive in this business for ten years with five albums is still pretty good going, isn't it? I think it's. I think it's quite an endurance test for, for for any band, you know, to keep going, when, you know, the climate is just getting worse and worse in terms of people buying music. And how are you finding that? I mean, in terms of albums now, are people buying the physical copies? You're doing it on download. How's that changed in your uh, ten-year careers with five albums? How's that changed? So, uh, people don't need to buy albums anymore. What's that? Sorry. Yeah. So, so it's it's changed. So the the screen your, is freezing. I know. Occasionally, you freeze. You're, you're, you're yeah. doing the sort of um. Uh, the fantastic, so like a new dance, if they had that robotic dance, so I, I love it. This is, this is like, the, it sounds like a Lena Lovage song, actually. Okay. <laughs> it I'll, start speak, I'll start speaking really high then. Well, that'll be good. If you do that with the movement, I think it doesn't matter about the robotic stuff, it will introduce itself with the, with the connection, but I think that's great. I love it. But, but the music industry, even in 10 years, it's changed massively, hasn't it? Yeah, it really has. It really has. Um, and I think even people who were kind of, you know, very wanting to be old school and, you know, wanting to have a record, wanting to have a CD, I think even those people are caving in to Spotify and, you know, and even, I mean, even DJs who are, have just been so anti this whole kind of Spotify DJ thing. They're doing it as well, you know. I think I think you can't really resist the the change. And although vinyl is is you know really popular, I think it's such a relatively small percentage of people in reality. And how do, you, how do you like your music to be heard? Do, do you prefer vinyl to, to digital? Yeah, we've 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 done one vinyl single and one vinyl album, and it's it just feels much more precious, you know. It feels it feels more enduring. But it's a nightmare to go on tour with. Right. You know, you just can't really stick a bunch of albums in your suitcase. Well, I've seen artists. Do we <laughs> tend to do quite long tours as well. So, yeah. and, and, you know, going from kind of pretty much continent to continent. So it's, I mean, just the, you know, I have to take a guitar in, in I take a guitar apart and yeah. stick it in my suitcase. I can't put a bunch of albums in there as well. But they're heavy, aren't they, apart from anything else? And that's they're heavy, a... and, and obviously they're very fragile, so, you know? But, but, but you're right, I mean, apart from the difficulty of carrying them around, to, to hold an album, it's a work of art, as you say, if you look at the iconic album cover. Oh, it's so different, yeah. yeah. It's so different. 
No, absolutely amazing. And what talk to me about technology. A lot of artists now, because they're they're staying at home and having to do these Zoom interviews and Zoom concerts and so on and so forth. Uh, a lot of them are looking at, as you know, we're involved with holograms and getting artists out there and we're recording them and then they can basically they can stay at home uh, and their hologram can perform the perfect performance every night. Um, I probably know your answer to this, but what do you think of that as the future? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, we did, we did a lot of um, live recordings in our living room and in our studio, which we did during the, you know, during the proper lockdown. Um, but I think, I think people are getting a little bit kind of tired of all this online stuff. And they, I think in a way, some people would just rather wait for the real thing now, you know, and we still, we did a, we did um as our sort of fluff TV thing on uh, the other the other night, and people people really appreciate it. But it's 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 a lot of work, you know. It's a lot of work, and it's fun, but it's also so fleeting, you know. The streaming stuff, it's so fleeting. I don't think you're right. And the, the other thing which, which you're great at is, and, and those who've really managed to embrace this side, are those who understand that actually it's, it's an a, a easy way of connecting people on a one-to-one -one basis. Because obviously when you're, it's very different when you're on a stage, you say you're, you're a naturally shy person, where actually it's probably more uncomfortable talking on a one-to-one -one basis than it is appearing in front of thousands, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not that scary though, am I? No, I'm okay. I'm okay one-to-one -one, actually. It's more, it's more in, uh, in bigger groups. I'm not, I'm not so comfortable. I'm, I'm better now than I used to be, you know, but I'm not, I'm not an, um, a naturally kind of very sociable person. You know, I, I'm, I pretend, I, I prefer to speak kind of one-to-one -one generally. Well, and it's more like, people get, People get to know you you're a lot more as a result. And as you say, you're a prolific creator. Talk to me about um, the creative process when you're coming up with new compositions. What, what do you do? People always ask, well, apart from the, the obvious things, are you coming to formulate an idea in your mind and the music comes first, the words come first, or does it change on a composition? By it, composition? Ch it changes all the time. So occasionally, I'll I, I use uh, logic. Occasionally, I'll just say, okay, I'm just, I'm going to do it. A new song now and I'll just sit down and play around and it almost always will end up in a in a song you know it, it will make its way in, and and end up as a song uh, sometimes I have a lyric sometimes a, a melody line sometimes I write with the guitar like with out of time I just I just started playing that guitar riff just with the one string and and that happens and you know, sometimes the songs just come out very, very quickly. Sometimes it takes longer to find the lyrics. You know, sometimes I have the, all the backing done, I have the melody line, but I don't know what the song's about. And often that comes to, the words often come to me when I'm cycling around. When I, okay. <laughs> yeah, and I have, to, I have to sort of suddenly stop and, and, um, and sing into my phone and record record what's come into my head because I have a really bad memory and I won't I won't remember otherwise. Oh, right. So so you would be cycling around the countryside, and then all of a sudden you'll be stuck there and, and you come out and dictate you dictate to you or you tap it into your phone. No, I just I just press the rec the recorder on and just record myself and, and and obviously I don't want anyone else to hear me, so I'm sort of <laughs> Recording it. There's a, a crazy woman dictating yeah. things on the yeah. phone. Or I'll, I'll stop off, I'll get, go into an alley somewhere. And, mm -mm. Well, that's probably even scarier. You know, you come out with some of those lyrics in an alley. It's just, yes. stay away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's glorious. It's glorious. So, so what are you working on at the moment? Are, have, you, have you been in any dark alleys recording stuff at the moment? I just, actually, I've, I've written... Um, one new song, I, w I was resisting writing during the lockdown, so I thought, I don't want to sing about this bloody virus and social distancing. And, but I ended up, I think, I think the, um, you know, the pent up frustration was, was so strong. And I ended up writing a song that's 163 BPM. Wow, that'll get them going. That, that'll Insane finish them off. If, if the virus doesn't finish them off, that'll finish them. <laughs> 
And this song ended up, it, it was about wanting to perform and, and wanting to actually touch people and kind of share our spit, you know? I mean, it was really, <laughs> but you know what I mean? That's what it's like when you're, when you're performing, you know? And I, I kind of hand my microphone to people and, and the thought of doing that now, obviously, is just, is just kind of terrifying. But um, yeah, you'd, lo you'd lose yeah. that moment, wouldn't you? People had to sanitize it before you passed it. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me a minute. Just have a, ro a roadie with some disinfectant wipes. Disinfectant, <laughs> absolutely. You have your little cloths on the side. Dawn's going to pass you the microphone now. If you like to socially distance, put your mask on. <laughs> Very good, thank you. I could <laughs> it's a different sort of a concert. <laughs> Yes, I, I, I can see that may not work. It's be, but, but your plans, are, I, I love this, is wonderful stuff. So you cycle around, you record things in dark alleys, you'll be 160 zillion beats per minute. It's gonna full of energy getting back there. What are your plans? I mean, are you anticipating doing gigs? Have you got some penciled in? Or, or, I mean, what, what's the story there? Um, we've got nothing in the diary now. I don't think there's any point at all in scheduling gigs that may be cancelled because it's just disappointing. You know, th there was one thing we were supposed to do. We were, we were supposed to play a festival in the countryside by a lake in Berlin and that got cancelled because people were creating stories about people having COVID who ran the place, you know. So that all went out the window. And that's the only thing we've agreed to do. You know, we've, people have asked us to play socially distanced gigs inside and then I, I don't want to do that I, I kind of rather wait at the moment I'd rather wait um yeah I mean as you say it's not it's soon, not you it's not, it's not a das actually, sorry yeah I was just saying it's not a das fluff gig if it's socially distanced I mean by the no. very nature you know it's not, no, I mean, not it's, you're it's in there it's a nightmare to do, to do a gig with a few people dotted around sitting sitting down and not dancing so having a picnic I mean, that's, <laughs> like, that's like playing in North Korea or something you know, just, <laughs> would you like to play in North Korea well I did I did play in South Korea I, I, I know you did I know you did <laughs> I, so would you like to play in North Korea it, it would be interesting, but no. <laughs> I, I think well, they probably... I can arrange it. I, I think this will, we could send you. You could pedal on your bike. They have a lot of bicycles over there. There are a lot of dark alleys. You could be quite creative. <laughs> you could have the microphone. I think it'd be brilliant. I'll tell you what. That would be a great TV documentary. Das fluff in North Korea because they had. I, I, well, a number of people have gone to North Korea as a principal, haven't they? Oh, you've frozen. Oh, you're back again. You froze just a moment. I think froze out of fear. Can you hear me now? Yeah, you froze as well. You froze as well. I froze as well. I'll tell you what, yes. I think it's all Christian Rulland's fault. Do you know who Christian Christian is? No. No, but that your name interesting. When it popped up on this computer, it came up with Christian's name. So it's Christian. Oh yeah, sorry, that yeah, that Chris I'm on I'm on his computer. Oh yes. no, I gather. I go, no, I, I don't know him, I don't know Claire, you're making Okay, right, right. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know Chris, him. Oh, that Christian, I mean, the guy who's okay, computer the, the, on. One yeah. I, the one I've been living with for 26 years, yeah. That one, yes. So, so when I said, do you know Christian? No, never heard of him. <laughs> never heard of him. Denial knowledge. It's, a, it's one of those sort of things. Christian? Christian who? <laughs> Oh, the guy I lived with for 26 years, it's kind of, it's kind of good. Oh, we love it, we love it. Uh, interesting stuff. So, times will change. Uh, you're being superbly creative. We look forward to seeing more of that sort of stuff. In the meantime, I'm really enjoying uh, this fifth album. I think, um, I, I think it's sensational. I, I love, it does take you on a, a fascinating journey. Um, and I always ask all my guests this, and it sounds a bit morose, but it's not meant to be, uh, because it encapsulates a moment in time. Because... Um, with all the rich history that you've had and everything that you've done, how would you like to be remembered? I, I don't know if I have any choice because I think people, people just think I'm a bit mental. Um, so I think that's probably how I'll be remembered. I mean, I, I think... I'm I'm st I'm kind of still behaving like I'm a teenager and I can't really see that ending. So I think it will be, you know, that woman who 
still dresses like a teenager and acts like a teenager and really should be in a care home. <laughs> I think that's how I'll be remembered. I, 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 but the great thing is at least you will be remembered. I, I, I love it, but as opposed to Christian who you forgot after 26 <laughs> years and, and poor old Claire, and they'll never forget Dawn Litton. It has been such a joy catching up. Uh, look after you. yourself, take care, and I look forward to seeing you live very, very soon. Right. Thanks so much. It's been really fun. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye, Dawn. Bye bye. So, the wonderful Dawn Litton from Das Fluff. If you'd like to be a guest on the show, write to me at guests at octopustv.com. Don't forget to subscribe at Octopus TV on all the usual channels on YouTube, on Daily Motion. You can follow on Twitter, you can stalk on any platforms you like. Whatever happens, do stay in touch. It's great to hear from you. I've been Andrew Eborn. My guest today, Dawn Litton from Das Fluff. Thank you again for joining me. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>